cool title sequence. Not that I have one. Um, maybe I will one day. Anyway, uh, what's up, YouTube? It's me again. I'm back with a, another topic review uh, for my data science program. So if you're new to the channel, you don't know, uh, I'm a student at a coding boot camp right now called Flatiron School. I'm in the data science program. I'm doing the flex. It's like all online. Um, <clears throat> and I just began phase three like a week or two ago. Uh, I'm working my way through the modules now. And my basic um, study strategy as I move through these modules is I try to condense everything for every module into one uh, a one page front and back notebook paper. Uh, and the way I normally do this is I have up here uh, topics from other modules that the current module you can't see because it it's blurred out, but um, it connects you. I'm only in module two, and so this will fill up later on as uh, as things progress through the module. And then this is like big ideas from the module. Um, there's not a lot here on that side, um, but you can see that I filled up pretty much the whole other back of the page, which is all these are like details about the um, big ideas in the module. So last time I did a topic review like this, it went on for like 45 minutes, which is a lot longer than I wanted it to be. Um, and I, I was doing it kind of extemporaneously the way I do my live streams. And I was just thinking that's maybe not the best way to do it for the sake of YouTube. Uh, and it would also be important to, um, I think, or helpful for me to learn the content, um, taking a different approach with these topic review videos. So this notebook paper right here is more for my reference for me to like quickly go back and like jog my memory like, oh, okay, yeah, I remember that. Um, so that helps me organize my thoughts and helps me really like solidify ideas in my mind when I do that. Um, but I, I decided this time to take it a step further and I actually made a little Jupyter notebook um, kind of uh, outlining all of the big ideas and concepts in this module. So that's what this video is gonna be is me basically going through that notebook that I made where I'm sort of uh, reviewing everything that we went through in the module. So I just wanna add a little disclaimer I don't do this on uh, behalf of Flatiron School. Uh, they don't even, I don't like know that they even know that I do this. Um, I will, however, be using some code and example contents from the Flatiron School curriculum. So some of the code and the particular like math problems and things that you're gonna see in this video are not my original work, um, but my commentary on it will be original nonetheless. So with that said, uh, let's get into it. So here's our notebook here. Um, but before we go into that, I want to show you this cool thing. And this is, I'll leave a link to um, this website in the video description. But this is a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is OLS uh, regression technique, which is, we'll talk about what that is later if you don't already know. Um, but basically, all that is is the math behind how you can see when I move these this data point or really any of these data points around it uh, manipulates the slope of this line right here if you kind of refer back to uh, algebra class way back in eighth ninth grade or whenever you take algebra in school uh, you can think of this regression line right here is basically like an average of all of these like data points here. So of course, if we bring all these data points closer to the line, it might better um, represent like what's really going on there. And you can see how outliers might drastically like affect um, the how well the line fits the data. So that's why, um, like you saw in my project live streams for the uh, pro phase two project, uh, dealing with outliers was a pretty big thing that we dealt with. So anyway, this is just a cool website. Um, it really helps visualize what is going on um, with all this like weird math stuff that we're going to talk about today. And this is sort of demonstrating. Um, you can see this red plane here is a regression line in 3D. So if you have like a three-dimensional linear regression. Um, so yeah, really cool website. I'll leave a link in the description. So after this, if you're curious about this topic, this would be a just a little kind of blog post thing that I would highly recommend checking out. So 
Now let's get into the topic review. Make sure I get all my windows and everything set up. Oh, we better uh, start our kernel. Okay, so first, uh, let's just do like a little bit of an overview. Let me make sure I get all my stuff organized here. My outline, I mean. I'm just gonna be kind of using this as like a checkbox as I go uh, through the notebook today. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about the data types um, pertinent to what we're talking about today. Uh, I'll actually do that right now real quick. You're gonna hear me use a lot of these words right here today, scalar, vector, matrix, and tensor. And there's a visualization later on that'll make uh, these a little bit more sense. But if you imagine a matrix as essentially like a spreadsheet or like a grid, um, the a vector is either a row or column from that matrix. So it's a set of numbers. Uh, a matrix is a set of vectors, right? Uh, and a scalar is an individual value. So a vector is a set of scalars, right? And uh, if you're keeping up, you'll probably infer that tensors are a set of matrices. So you can think of like a, um, what would it be, fourth order tensor, third order tensor, I don't know. Um, the next step up from a matrix would be basically like a 3D matrix where you have uh, rows, columns, and like layers or planes or sheets, or there's some word for it, I forget what it is. It doesn't matter, point being, that anything beyond two dimensions is uh, going to be referred to as a tensor. Although all of these are technically tensors of some order. So a scalar is like a zeroth order tensor or a first order tensor. I don't know whether they, it starts at zero or one for tensors. But um, scalar is a single number, vectors a list of numbers to put it in like Python terms. Um, matrix is a grid, a two dimensional array uh, in terms of like NumPy. And a tensor is like a three or more dimensional array. We're going to talk a little bit about systems of equations, um, the substitution elimination method, how to solve those. Just, that'll probably, if you paid attention in math class in school, or if you are a math person yourself, um, that'll be pretty familiar stuff. We'll talk a little bit about matrix algebra, um, basically how to solve linear or systems of equations, where instead of having single numbers for our coefficients or scalars, we have like whole matrices. Um, so that's really going to be a lot of the meat and potatoes. And then we'll get into uh, linear regression uh, using matrices. Um, so doing which linear regression is basically like a statistical modeling technique based on linear algebra. Uh, and there's the same way you can do algebra with matrices. You can do linear regression with matrices instead of individual scalars. So let's talk first about systems of equations. Uh, so system of equations is basically uh, right here uh, two or more linear equations that share the same set of variables. So if you have like you know m plus c equals four, and then you have like two m plus three c equals six or something like that, um, it's important that the two equations like share the same variable. So you couldn't have like m plus c equals 4 and then m plus x equals 5. That would not be uh, exactly what we're talking about today, at least when we talk about systems of linear equations. So here's an example problem from the curriculum. Jim has more money than Bob. If G uh, Jim gave Bob $20, they would have the same amount. If Bob gave Jim $22, Jim would then have twice as much as Bob. So using uh, systems of linear equations, uh, an algebra on that, we can essentially solve this question here. How much does each one, Jim and Bob, actually have? How much money do each of them have based on this information that we have here? So for the sake of our algebraic notation, we're going to let X be the amount of money that Jim has. So X represents Jim or the dollars in Jim's wallet and Y is going to be the dollars in Bob's wallet. So I don't want to show you like all of it at once. Eh, it doesn't really matter. So um, this first sort of factoid we have here, John has more money than Bob, therefore X is greater than Y. Uh, 
doesn't tell us a whole lot. That doesn't help us like solve the system's equations necessarily, but it does. Um, it's good to keep in mind at the end so that we verify that we got the right answer. So if we get an answer where y is greater than x, we know that we did something wrong, right? Um, the next piece of information we have is that Jim, if Jim gives Bob twenty dollars, then they would have the same amount of money. So what that looks like in algebraic notation is if Jim x gave twenty dollars away, so x minus twenty equals uh, Bob y plus twenty. So Jim we loses this uh, value of twenty and y gains this value of 20 because Jim is giving Bob twenty dollars right um, we also know that yeah uh, if Bob gave Jim twenty two dollars Jim would have would then have twice as much as Bob right so if Jim y gave Bob twenty two dollars you see this y minus twenty two Jim's give or Bob's giving away twenty two dollars and Jim is gaining twenty two dollars in that instance then uh, this side of the equation is going to be or sorry this side of the equation is going to be twice as much as this side of the equation um, or in other words Bob's going to have twice as much uh, or Jim's gonna have twice as much as Bob so for this to equal this side of the equation, we need y minus 22 times 2, right? Um, I hope I'm explaining that clearly. But basically, like, you take 22 away from y and you give it to x. That gives you x plus 22. But now to make sure that both sides of this equation are equal, we know that this is twice as much as whatever Bob has. So we wrap it in the parentheses and put a 2 around it. We multiply it. By two. So uh, now, using the elimination method, uh, which is essentially where you uh, eliminate like variables or any sort of like digits that you can get rid of easily, that sort of thing. Um, doing a little bit of simple algebra using elimination, we can find that x equals y plus forty. So we take equation a, basically and we add twenty dollars to both sides so that's going to cancel out the twenty here and then we're just left with x over here and that twenty we're adding over here turns this into forty so that's how we get x equals y plus forty and we're going to call that equation c just to kind of uh, keep everything organized in our mind right now we can subs use substitution so now we solve for one variable we can substitute uh, the equation representing that variable in a different equation Right, so we're, now that we have something that represents x that isn't x itself, we're going to plug that into equation b. This x plus 22 equals 2, y minus 22. Uh, so you see here we just replaced x with y plus 40, right? Because we know that x equals y plus 40, so we can just replace it there. <clears throat> now we do a little bit of simple algebra. Um, when you're doing substitution, uh, you, or you anytime you're doing like algebra like this where you're balancing equations uh, generally my intuition is to follow PEMDAS um, so even though you're on two different sides of the of the equatorial or whatever this is called so like if we immediately added like say we know that y plus 40 plus 22 that's um, 62 that could potentially get us into some trouble so you, you want to Generally, you have the best of luck, I find, if you follow PEMDAS when you're balancing equations like this and doing substitution, that sort of thing. So the first thing we're going to do is divide both sides by 2 because we're multiplying by 2 here. So to get rid of this, we're going to multiply or divide both sides by 2. So we're left with simply y equals 22 over here. And we then uh, divide 22 by 2, 40 by 2. That gives us 11 and 20 and then y over 2. Now we can easily add... Uh, 20 and 11 to give us 53. Ah, ah, I see what I did here. Uh, so we can add 20 and 11. That gives us 31. But then we're also going to add uh, 22 to both sides. That's going to cancel out this 22 here. And we're going to add 22 to that 31. And that's going to give us 53. 
sorry, I was trying to be not extremely verbose when I was writing this. Uh, so that's what's happening here. We're adding everything up here, and then we're adding 22 to both sides to get rid of this. And that leaves us with simply y equals y over 2 plus 53. Now, we want to multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of this 2 right here. And that's going to leave us with uh, 53 times 2 is 106. And multiplying this by 2 is going to cancel out entirely. Remember, there's you can basically imagine a 1 next to this y. So if we uh, multiply that by 2, then that's just going to... Um, it's going to cancel it out and we're left with y equals 53 times 2 which is 106 uh, so now we've solved uh, directly for y uh, directly to a scalar and not some variable um, so now we can substitute again uh, y for into our equation c that we got here so then we know that x uh, replace the y with 106 x equals 106 plus 40, x equals 146. So we know that Bob has $106 and Jim has $146 based on this information that we were given here. Uh, and that's basically systems of equations. As long as you have the same set of variables, then you can pretty much solve for any variable. And you also, of course, like need some constants in there too. If it was just like x plus y equals y then you wouldn't be able to do anything or like this right here there's no constants here so like i said uh, that doesn't help us solve the equation but it does now help us ensure that we got the right answer and we know that 146 is of course greater than 106 so x is indeed greater than y so that's systems of equations in a nutshell uh, or a quick example of it again here's a good visualization of exactly what I was talking about earlier, I was talking about scalars, vectors, matrices, and tensors. Um, cool picture. I don't, I don't have much else to say about that, honestly. Um, but in the same way that you can solve systems of equations where... Um, so, like, we know that these, this x and this y, anywhere it occurs, what it's basically representing is some unknown scalar value, right? A single number. Um, however... We can also do algebra in that same way with vectors and matrices where those variables, those letters that you see, represent sets of numbers uh, in the form of either vector or a matri matrix or uh, a tensor as well. That's a little outside the scope of today. Mostly we're going to be dealing with vectors and matrices, but point being that you can do algebra with these any order of tensor uh, as well, as long as you have, again, the same set of variables. So let's talk a little bit about the different types of operations that you can do on matrices because uh, it's not exactly, uh, the math doesn't exactly uh, work the way you might intuit it to. Let me, hmm. uh, toggle breadcrumbs, no, I'm not going to worry about that now. I kind of want to make this collapse this toolbar here, but it's okay. So anyway, um, your intuition might be if you have two matrices, matrices to just like multiply the numbers by their corresponding index, right? So if you have like a matrix of four values, like one, two, three, four, you might multiply one and then another one in the matrix of, of like like dimensions, you might multiply like zero, zero by zero, zero, like that cor coordinate. Um, that only works when you have two matrices of the exact same dimensions. Uh, it's also, for reasons that I'm not necessarily aware of, not used that often. Um, it doesn't, it's not extremely useful for actual data analysis and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, that's called the Hadamard product. Uh, and it's notated with this little circle symbol here. So every time you see that, you just know that that's the Hadamard product. Um, and you can do this in Python by simply typing, you know, declaring like some matrix uh, to a variable and multiplying it using just the multiplication symbol uh, on another matrix that's assigned to another variable. Uh, there's also a thing called a cross product, which uh, the if you just Google cross product, you can see some like good visualizations on this. Um, 
but it results in a vector that's perpendicular to each of the vectors being multiplied. So this only works with vectors, which is kind of like the big takeaway here. Um, you can imagine a vector is a set of numbers. So if you imagine like a, a 3D space, right, um, that might be like points along a line. Uh, and if you have two sets of points along a line, two vectors, um, your cross product is when you multiply those vectors by each other, it's going to end up giving you a vector that's perpendicular to the two of them, right? So you'll have like two vectors going like this and then uh, another, your, your C, your resulting vector when you multiply it will be perpendicular to the two of them wherever they intersect at. Um, kind of interesting math going on, not very useful, at least within the scope of what we're talking about today. I'm sure it's useful within the scope of math, but in the scope of the data science necessarily, it's not exactly uh, gonna be used a whole lot. Uh, you do have like, uh, you can do this pretty easy with code. You just use your NumPy library and use a dot cross method uh, and pass in your, your vectors and you're good to go. Uh, dot product is what we're actually going to be using a lot today. Um, so it's most commonly used at least for linear regressions or solving systems with linear equations with matrices, matrix algebra in other words. Um, there is one big caveat here you see like in big bold so you have an array a and array b uh, and array a must have the same number of columns as array b has rows okay uh, and this is your calculus notation for it if you don't know this sigma symbol in calculus notation at least basically i think of it as it represents a for loop um, but you can see that a i k and then B, K, J, so you have a K and a K here. That's representing the fact that A has the same amount of columns as B has rows. Um, so in this notation, it's like rows, columns, always. So uh, also an interesting thing to note is that the resulting matrix is going to have the rows from A and the column, the, the amount of rows from A and the amount of columns from B. Uh, again, this can easily be achieved in Python using NumPy using this dot method right here. Uh, transposition is an interesting thing to understand. Uh, the transposition is used quite a lot throughout this module. Um, the big thing that it took me like I had to like it's not complicated, but I had to like stop and like think about it for a second. Uh, you rotate your your array 90 degrees, but then you also uh, have to reverse the order of each row in the array after you've done that. So you can see like this array here, if we were to only rotate at 90 degrees, you would have like one, two, and three right here where seven, eight, and nine are, but it's over here. So you have to rotate 90 degrees and then reverse the order uh, of each row. So those are the different types of operations that you can do on a matrix. Uh, mostly we're worried about the dot product and the transposition and yeah we're going to talk about inverse matrix next so there are some special matrices i don't know why this is yeah there we go um so there's the identity matrix before we talk about inverse matrix there's the identity matrix and basically the identity matrix is the matrix equivalent of the number one uh, and we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment but basically you'll know from arithmetic that any number to multiply by one uh, is simply, uh, or one multiplied by any, by any number n is like simply going to be one. Um, or that should be an n there. Anyway, one's a really cool number, uh, or really interesting, does a lot of good things for math. <laughs> um, I'm getting a little bit out of my depth here with all this math stuff, but uh, that's what these videos are for. So anyway, uh, the identity matrix is a square matrix in which all scalars along the major diagonal, which is just the top left to the bottom right, are ones and everything else is zeros. And when you actually in the real world like find your identity matrix of a given matrix, um, you will sometimes end up with really, really, really tiny decimals and you just like, you just round. Um, and that pretty much solves that problem. 
But basically, any like dimension of matrix has square matrices, matrices at least, has an identity matrix associated with it. Um, but you can see here, this is a great example. You have one, two, three, four, pretty simple matrix. And this would be the corresponding identity matrix. It's available in NumPy using the dot identity method where you pass some array into it. Uh, and this is your sort of mathematical notation for it. And so this is what I really mean by it's like the matrix equivalent of one. Um, because, yeah, this should be. Um, so yeah, any matrix times its identity matrix is simply itself, right? Uh, and that's what makes it similar to one. Um, you can't have, you know, by nature of being a matrix, you can't have just multiply a matrix by one necessarily. So you have to have this thing called the identity matrix. And that's basically what it serves as is, uh, one in the world of matrices. Uh, just like you have inverse numbers. Uh, in, elsewhere in other like fields of math, you have the inverse matrix in matrix algebra, uh, and we won't get into the math of how the individuals like each individual scalar is calculated. Um, but the big takeaway here is that a matrix times its inverse is its corresponding identity matrix, right? Um, so that is really useful because there's no um, definition for how to divide matrices, right? So we use the identity matrix or these inverse matrix, excuse me, to compensate for that fact. So there's a little example here from the curriculum. Uh, so you imagine you have 10 apples you want to share with two people and you, you can divide it by two which is what most like normal people would probably do. Or you can also multiply by uh, two's reciprocal or the inverse of two, which is 0.5. Uh, and that gives you the same answer. So bec although there's no defined way to divide matrices in matrix algebra, we can achieve what would be the same result by uh, multiplying by the inverse uh, matrix. So that's what's really cool about the inverse matrix. It, it, base, it essentially allows us to do division on matrices without like actually doing division. So, oh my God. There we go. It keeps like these texts keep like showing up behind the markdown. And I, when I rerun the cell, it just like fixes it. So we're just gonna deal with that, I guess. Um, but anyway, so for a single linear equation, you can basically do algebra on it if you uh, respect the principles of like the dot product and um, transpose properly and respect the principles of your identity matrix and all this other stuff that we discussed above. With respect to those rules, if you will, um, you can solve systems of linear equations uh, and do algebra on matrices. Uh, do, or do algebra where your coefficients represent matrices. All right, uh, little notation note, uh, you'll notice that these are all big capital letters now. So anytime you're dealing with anything beyond uh, simply a scalar, uh, when you have like a set of numbers, Excuse me. you're going to have um, uh, a capital letter representing that. So I kind of want to get into like really like the code stuff, but this is basically a proof for how you would solve for x from from here right um, so we multiply both sides by the inverse and then we know that multiplying anything by its inverse is simply that own thing so we can cancel out like this here and just replace it for i so now we know that the identity matrix of a uh, times x equals a inverse times b and again with uh, substitution we can uh, eliminate I because we know that anything multiplied by the identity matrix 
uh, is itself. And we know that X is going to have to have the same dimension. It, it, like I, the identity matrix of A is going to have to be the same identity matrix of X because you're going to have the same dimensions, right? So we know that X equals inverse of A times B. And we already knew what A and B were in the first place. So uh, assuming we had those matrices in front of us, we could easily do that calculation, right? Um, so uh, we could have done this early, above with that uh, the systems equation we solved earlier, uh, but you can basically create a matrix from uh, a system of linear equations. If you have more equations, you could just like add rows or columns or what, whatever's necessary to your matrices to do that. Um, but this is what that would look like if you were going to notate in matrix notation uh, a system of equations. Sorry for moving through this a little fast. I feel like most of like what this is about is like the actual like data science and writing the code and whatnot. Um, so I, I don't want to dwell too much on like you know eighth grade math stuff. Um, but so here's here's a uh, um, example problem, and we're gonna solve it with Python now. So a coffee shop is having a sale of cough on coffee and tea. On day one, they sell 29 bags of coffee and 41 bags of tea, uh, and they sold that for a total of $490. So we notate that as 29C for coffee and 41T for uh, tea uh, equals 490 or $490. And likewise, they sold 23 bags of coffee on day two and 41 bags of tea on day two for a total of $448. So how much does each bag cost? So uh, first we're gonna import NumPy. Then we're gonna define our matrices. So this is basically a Python-y version of this type of notation right here, right? So this first matrix is my matrix A. So these are my um, coefficients, 29, 41, 23, 41. You see here, uh, it's written a little weird but imagine this is what you're looking at. Now that looks a little bit more like, like matrix notation, right? But it's kind of ugly code to read. Uh, and then, of course, we have our uh, constants, I guess you would call them, the $409 from day one, $448 from day two. And each one of these sets of brackets is uh, a row we have a two by two matrix here so that we know um, that we're kind of satisfying that columns and rows thing um, so we can so that means that we can in fact find the dot product of these two matrices and we can do math with them together uh, the first thing we're going to do is find the inverse of matrix a and we're going to transpose t or b uh, using this dot t method here uh, and that's just positioning matrix B in a way that it's uh, compatible to run your dot product with. Um, so, and then we have our inverse of A, we have B uh, transpose, we can find the dot product of both of those. And remember, because we know from above that X equals the inverse of A times B. So we're setting our variable X to equal a inverse, which we've defined here, uh, dot product with B, which we've defined here, and we just transpose it here um, to make it compatible for the dot product. We're going to run that, and we find that a bag of coffee and a bag of tea are both $7. So that's how you would solve a system of equations uh, for matrix algebra with Python. All of that is really just like to drive home a point. I wouldn't recommend actually coding it in that way, uh, especially with larger and larger data sets. So this can all be done pretty sleekly in a couple lines of code right here. I don't know what that was. Uh, but you can see that gives us the same answer. So this is a pretty just sleek uh, NumPy method that we have available. So let's get into the real meat and potatoes, uh, the regression 
analysis. Man, I don't. It keeps saying, you see what I mean? Like it says cells hidden, and it's like there's no, there's no cells hidden. Could be in opponent. Anyway, um, so regression analysis is basically when you fit a mathematical model, which is represented by this line here, to observed data points. Um, the resulting line, the regression line, uh, represents what the model's predictions uh, are based on the model. So um, if you imagine this line kept going on, the model's predicting that any new data points are going to occur along that line. And of course, we know that it's not going to perfectly fit that line as we go, and that gets into like our error terms and stuff, which we'll talk about in a minute. But that's basically the idea. Um, you've probably seen this whoops, uh, equation before, y equals mx plus c, or, or b. Um, this was taught to me in school. But basically, uh, C is the y-intercept when mx equal, is equal to 0, right? Or in other words, it's at any given at point on the x-axis, the distance between um, the x-axis itself and the regression line, if you wanted to think about it like that. Uh, and mx is more or less the slope of your line, your rise over run, if you remember that from school back in the day. Um, also, I'm going to link this notebook uh, in the video description if you would like to read this notebook more in depth later on, because um, I don't, you know, I don't want to just like read all this like verbatim, right? I don't even know how long. Uh, we're going, we're at 36 minutes now. Um, Whew, okay, <laughs> so um, what time is it anyway? Nah, it doesn't matter. We're going to finish the video. So uh, that's a broad overview of what model fitting is. Uh, is your choice doing a bunch of math stuff to try to get this line to fit this cluster of data points as closely as possible. Um, so for instances where you're using only vectors you can use this polyfit function in numpy um, but like I said the big limitation here is that that only works when you're dealing with vector inputs uh, so like not necessarily matrices and that sort of thing um, which might be useful for like some use cases, but you can see here we have some random data generated um, and we have this line where the, da the data is completely random. So of course there's not like a real relationship to be found here, but you can see how this line is like trying to find like the, it's, it's basically trying to draw a line where the cumulative distance from between all these data points to the line. So from here to here, from here to here, from here to here and from here to here. If you added up all those distances, those are called your residuals. Uh, it's trying to find a, the line where those residuals are the least. Uh, so that works a lot better when the data is not random. But just to kind of show you an example of the code, right? Uh, pretty simple stuff as far as the programming side of things goes. So, um, when we're dealing with, uh, how do I put this? When we're dealing with matrices, uh, and especially when we're trying to like minimize, when we're trying to minimize our error term E, this residual thing I'm talking about, um, we do that using a method called ordinary least squares, which is a type of regression modeling. As I understand it, there's other forms of regression modeling. Uh, ordinary least squares is just one of them. Um, so I'm trying to like not read read this verbatim for you. Uh, basically, we end up with doing a little bit of like algebra and proofing. We end up with this formula where be, be, beta b equals x transpose times x, the inverse of that, times x transpose y. Uh, 
um, we're assuming that we already know um, the values of x, which is a matrix, and y, which is a scalar value, I believe, or it might, yeah, it might be a vector, it's a vector, um, so it's an intercept. So um, you can imagine that can be solved with some algebra, like relatively easily. So um, with least squares regression, we, what we're trying to do is solve for the expected value of weights, which is referred to or notated as x hat, um, which you need to solve the, this above equation, you need to solve for beta in order to calculate x hat. So that's what we're about to do. So like I said earlier, the goal is to choose the vector x for unknown variables to make e, our error term, uh, as small as possible, right? So we're trying to, visually speaking, we're trying to make the gaps between these data points in this line cumulatively as little as possible. Whew, okay. So um, the f first thing we wanna do is we're first going to import the data, um, and we also need to when we're doing matrix algebra, or we're doing when we're doing ordinary least squares, we need to add a column to our input matrix to represent the intercept, um, or refer to the intercept rather, um, and that simply we're going to add a column of ones. Uh, in the first index position in the f as, at, as the first column for our in input uh, vector, input matrix, sorry. So we're gonna import a little bit of data here. This is just like some real estate data um, from the curriculum. Um, and so right here, you can see that we're adding a one uh, at the beginning of each row. Uh, and then the, we're appending that row to this uh, list that we instantiated. So this is gonna end up being a list of lists, an array, in other words. And then we're actually making it an actual NumPy object into an array right here. So all of this should give us a nice little bit of data to work with. I don't know why that was there. Um, but anyway, we know that this is basically this is basically the same formula that we saw above, just notated a little bit differently. Um, but yeah, the point being with the with the ones adding the column ones to the beginning, if you don't do that, then the function the regression line will be constrained to the origin, meaning it'll always go down to like the bottom left corner and then like up and away somewhere, but it'll always start at that bottom left corner. And you can imagine that's going to limit its predictive abilities with the data. Um, it's going to limit its ability to fit the data, right? So now that we have our data sort of prepared, um, and again, we're also assuming that this is all like numerical types and uh, there's no missing values and like all the same stuff you want to go through uh, when you're preparing data for analysis. Um, So now we're going to randomly sample the data into a set of training or a sample of training data to train the model with, uh, and then a sample of test data to test the model with and help us make predictions. Um, 80 20 is typically used. You can, there's no like rule or law that you can't do like 95 5 or 90 10 or 60 40 or, or whatever, um, but 80 20 is pretty, pretty typical, pretty standard, uh, at least in the data science world. Um, so we can do that in Python pretty easily. Um, so we take our um, array of indices. So this is basically like the index position of every row in our array. Um, so we're like sampling rows of data right um, because it wouldn't make sense to sample columns because those are completely different features uh, you can think of every row as a vector itself um, as a data point so 
uh, we use the random module from NumPy and we use this choice method to randomly sample from our data uh, and we're getting this uh, that's why we're using this like 0.8 number right here is because we're trying to get 80% of the data and we want to only use we don't want to replace the data that we're sampling we're gonna like whatever we don't take for our training sample we want to leave uh, for our test sample and we don't want to put back anything that we do take for our training sample so we set replace to false here so we set, get our sample of training data we get our sample of test data this little squiggle here uh, for numpy is basically like means to complement so this is saying everything in the indices that is in tr the training IDX we want the opposite of that the complement so that's kind of what's going on here and we're going to subset the data so now that we have our basically like what train IDX and, and test IDX is is a list of indices of the rows that are chosen for our train and our test samples now we need to actually grab those samples themselves uh, and we're going to do that by index slicing um, so that's what's going on here and we declare these variables so now we basically have two different rays train and test to represent that data that we've sampled and it's important to note that somewhere up around here I did yeah I set a, a seed um, just because I wanted mainly because I wanted to make sure that this visualization was the same time every time I recorded this um, so this isn't exactly like genuinely random in this notebook, but if you don't set your seed, this will be uh, genuinely random, um, or at least random as far as NumPy goes. I wouldn't. There's some limitations to that. Like if you, maybe I shouldn't say genuinely random, but it'll be random enough for your purposes uh, of data analysis at least. So we're just gonna make sure we got. Um, the correct shapes. So our original data had four, 546 rows and 13 columns. We see that we're not, we didn't lose any columns here, so that's good. And we know that 437 plus 109 is indeed 546. So our train test split looks good. So uh, now we need to remember in these variables here, train and test, that's everything. It's our set of uh, input vectors or features like big X if you will and it's also the feature that we're trying to predict why so we need to sort of separate those two so that's what we're doing here we have X train and Y train uh, is we're essentially grabbing like the particular column that we're trying to predict and everything else it's not that uh, we're doing grabbing that from our training data and we're doing the same thing here from our test data so now we have uh, X train and X test, which are matrices, so to speak, or arrays, however you want to, NumPy, it's an array, math, it's a matrix. Um, NumPy also has matrices too, same thing. Anyway, you we have our X train or X test, which are matrices or arrays of data, and then we have our Y train and our Y test, which are both vectors of data. And they've both been randomly sampled from the same population of data so we have um, that here and again if you just kind of want to check and make sure that we have uh, everything's like copacetic so you see now that we only have 12 columns in each one because we've removed a column uh, the our y column and we but we do still in fact have the correct number of rows uh, in our predictors as well as our estimators or like the big X okay so recall this formula from where to go here uh, no that's not what I was thinking of this formula right here uh, B equals the inverse of X transpose times X times X transpose times Y. Uh, 
So to put that in sort of NumPy notation, uh, that is this right here. So the x transpose of x train times x train itself, the inverse of that times the uh, transpose of x train times y train. So we're using all of our training data here to calculate beta or our or our beta vector. So the biggest problem, the challenge for me a lot of times is reading this calculus notation type stuff and then like transcribing it into code, right? So <clears throat> um, this whole block of code right here is basically what's going on in this parentheses right here. And this whole block of code right here is basically what's going on on the right side of the dot product uh, or dot operator uh, right here. Um, and this is essentially the whole equation uh, once all these little bits are defined, right? So we get, uh, we declare xt, and that's just the transpose of x train, right? And then we declare xtx, which is x transpose times x uh, train. And again, we're using the dot product for that. Um, and then we have the inverse of xdx. So that's this whole deal right here. So this line of code basically represents this whole and everything on the left side of the dot operator right there. Um, so that's what's going on, uh, going on there. And then this xty is everything on the right side of the dot operator, right? So we have x transpose uh, and y train. Um, it's worth mentioning too, you can also notate this in NumPy as xt dot y train, um, if that's easier for you to read. Um, but yeah, so everything left side of the dot operator, everything right side of the dot operator. So now we have um, basically xdx inverted and xty. Um, this alone is basically the whole left side of the dot operator. And this alone is basically the whole side that, that the whole right side of the dot operator. Um, and here you can see I use that kind of slightly different uh, notation. I don't know why it doesn't really ma matter make a difference, um, but we have xdx the inverse of xt x dot product of xt y. That's all that is here. We're going to call that beta. We're going to run it, and boom, we have our beta matrix. Zuz is back there moaning and groaning because he's bored. Um, math was once upon a time boring for me too. Now I'm like kind of slowly evolving into the huge nerd about it. Um, so now we can use our beta vector to make predictions. So we basically take the dot product. For, 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 uh, we take every we go through every row in our uh, testing sample, and we take get the dot product of that row uh, with the corresponding row in our beta matrix. Uh, so that's what this is for every row in X test. Now we're with X test. Uh, we make our prediction using row. So that's uh, all 12 data points in that vector, that horizontal vector. Uh, and we multiply it um, by beta uh, because we know that row is going to have the same columns as rows are in beta. So we can take the dot product of it. So then we append that to our list that we've instantiated here and we print it. And now we have a matrix of predictions for Y. Uh, and we could do a lot of things with this. We could plot it, we could do all sorts of stuff. Um, but this in mathematical uh, terms is going to be referred to as Y hat. So. Moving on, now we're going to, now that's, basically we've um, built our model at this point, right? Um, so now we're going to evaluate, like how like good of a model is it? Like how reliable is it to use? So 
the first thing that we're going to do is plot our actual or observed data points against our predicted data points and we get this visualization here and it, you know upon visual inspection it doesn't look that bad we can see that there's like some outliers here and there's maybe even like a like a trend or cluster of outliers uh, that we could maybe like fit a little bit better um, but generally speaking like we were pretty pretty point on point here um, but that's great to look at and kind of gives you a hint at if you're moving in the right direction or anything but it's not uh, quali quantitative uh, to say the least so to quantify exactly how accurate our model is we want to look at what's called the root mean squared error um, which you can basically think of it as an average for um, how much error there is in your model so we have all these residuals here which is like the distance again why am I there's like a highlight thing under my cursor anyway, anyway. Huh. okay um, so we have all our residuals here which is basically like the difference between our observed the data points and our actual data points um, so you can think of your root mean squared error as a mathematical representation of that uh, for the whole model or an average of your residuals basically it's not exactly that it's not that in mathematical terms but if you want to like think about or conceptualize it in that way um, that might be a good way to think of it as like there's different types of averages and that's like you know a sort of average for it um, but don't you know you think about it that way when you're taking like a math test <laughs> um, so anyway it's our, our the root mean squared error is uh, defined in our calculus notation uh, as this right here again this sigma symbol is uh, basically a for loop is what that means so again we're going to take this formula and we're going to turn it into code right so we're instantiating the empty list here just so we can have somewhere to put our data when we figure it out um, this is this little bit of our formula right here uh, and again so we're this sigma in i equals one thing all that's telling us is that we're iterating over however many rows there are in like our in input matrix basically right um, so and then the i represents so you can think of i as like changing as you go through n so starting at i equals one and you're going to go to like two three four five six so on um, so for every index basically uh, on the on axis uh, you know zero right for every row in our matrix we want to take our predicted data point minus our actual data point and we're going to square that and that's our squared error right um, it, it doesn't get much simpler than that it's like the error squared uh, so we're going to append that to that empty list that we got there and so then this will give us a uh, essentially a vector of our squared errors for all of our data points and then uh, you see this all of that is over in here in is the number of data points in our input here right so that when you take something any kind of like um, sum or, or whatever uh, and you divide it by the number of uh, data points in that thing that's an average that's, that's your mean right so that's all that's saying here is you want to get the mean of this collection whoops this collection of data I keep thinking I have like a marker that I can like draw with but I don't um, so we take our mean square to get our mean squared error uh, we just take the mean of our set or vector of squared errors right uh, and then of course to get our root mean squared error we take the square root of our mean squared error uh, we can run that and that gives us this really big fat number here as it turns out that is in terms of our target variable why uh, which in this case is house prices um, so that doesn't seem like as much as ridiculous of a number when you're thinking about house prices you know going into the hundreds of thousands and potentially millions uh, having a you know being off by fifteen thousand dollars is 
when you're talking about 250,000, half a million, one million dollar houses is like really not that much. However, uh, we want like to think about that in a little bit more objective way um, because that doesn't, that's not exactly the right way to think about it. That's not telling us that our, you know, any given data point might be off by $15,000. Um, this is in terms of our predictor uh, or target variable, right? And we have a lot of different variables in this data set. So we didn't go into it in depth, but you can imagine it's a real estate data set. So there's things like um, probably like square footage of the house, uh, the number of bathrooms, um, the size of the lot itself, all that sort of stuff, which is not, a lot of that's not even in dollars, right? Um, so we want to normalize that. So like how off are we for any given feature? You know what I mean? Um, not just for specifically for the target feature or the target variable. So to do that, we find the normalized root mean squared error, which is defined by this formula right here, um, which is not that complex, frankly. So we take our root mean squared error, which we've already calculated, uh, and then we're going to get the difference between the maximum of our training sample, our training target sample and the minimum of our training target sample uh, and we're going to divide the root mean squared error by that uh, and that gives us our normalized root mean squared error which is point oh when I wrote this <laughs> notebook last time it was point oh eight now it's point oh nine um, because I thought I set the random Seed. I'm gonna go back and look at that. That's interesting that it actually gave me a different result despite setting a seed. Um, but nonetheless, generally, like you know, you want things like in a range of like 0.2 to 0.5, uh, and this is well below that. So this is um, indicative that it's a pretty strong model, um, and we can, you know, qualitatively analyze it and make some good decisions based off of uh, what we find in this model. So, all that math, uh, as I go through this module, uh, was really fascinating and really interesting, and I started to like feel like I understood it, and I was getting a grip on it, and I can like do stuff with it, uh, and come to find out that uh, that's really not the way you would actually want to do stuff in the real world anyway, um, because of this thing called computational complexity. So basically different algorithms um, have different run times and they're described in terms of this thing called big O notation. It's a really cool visualization um, from the Flatiron curriculum. Um, and so basically like the x-axis here is as like the data sets get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, this is how the uh, how much more time an algorithm would take to run. Um, and this isn't in terms of like minutes or seconds necessarily, uh, because you can imagine like, it's kind of like relative to the machine that it's running on, so to speak. Uh, so if you imagine there was just like a super powered like Turing machine, uh, there would still be like some difference in how efficiently it could run like one algorithm as opposed to the other, if you know anything about Turing machines. Um, and as it turns out, uh, according to this proof here, um, oh, whoops. Now it's pretty. Um, as it turns out, the OLS, ordinary least squares regression, is very expensive in terms of computational requirements. Uh, so if you follow this little proof here, you'll find that basically we do a lot of like transpositions and inversions when we're doing uh, OLS, and it comes out to a um, big O notation of k squared times n plus K in being the amount of rows and K being the amount of columns that you have, uh, which is 
extremely expensive. So it basically comes down to uh, you can't do OLS with big data. Um, anything with less than a thousand columns and uh, less than a million rows, uh, you can probably get away with it. But any like data set that you're dealing with that's bigger than that, um, you're going to be sitting at your computer staring at the screen waiting for a really long time for that algorithm to actually run. Um, so you can imagine the debugging process would take ages if you had to wait for the whole thing to run just to see like what went wrong. So um, it's really great to understand all that math and algebra and stuff, but unfortunately, in big data at least, um, ordinary least squares is not the preferred method to perform regression analysis with. Um, and we're gonna learn uh, about how to deal with that in the next modules, uh, I believe. So the big point being, um, the linear algebra stuff was like really cool. Um, and the thing about like using like the inverse matrix to get the same result of what would be the result of dividing a matrix, but you can't really divide a matrix. Like that whole thing was just like super interesting to me, uh, for one. Also, um, um, lose my train of thought I'm trying to wrap this up too uh, OLS is really powerful you know like if, if with the, the approach with the right size data set it's like a really um, solid like uh, st strategy to use um, it's very the formula the actual like math itself is pretty like sleek um, and pretty intuitive uh, and so it's unfortunate that it's so computationally expensive um, because it is such an like an elegant formula um, but, uh, there are, so there are some use cases for it, but it's just like in the mo modder, <laughs> I'm so sorry for these typos. I was up to like three 30 last night, um, putting this together. So sorry about that. Um, in the real world context, there's more and more data every day. And so like, you know, even like regular data is becoming big data. Uh, so unfortunately there's not, uh, um, especially, at least in the field of data science, there's not a whole lot of use cases for uh, OLS, ordinary least squares. But understanding like the algebra and the math behind it and how it all works can uh, give you insight into how other sorts of algorithms work and you know how to debug them and manipulate them and like utilize them to your advantage and that sort of thing. Um, so if you're getting into data science, I would highly recommend getting into the math of ordinary least squares uh, if nothing else, just to give you some uh, context and some deeper understanding of like what's really going on uh, with your other algorithms and things that you use. And it'll probably, I would imagine, improve your um, ability to utilize other algorithms as well. Um, so with that said, that is the module 22 topic review on linear algebra uh, I hope you enjoyed it uh, I hope you hung in there um, at least like skipping through like the important bits and the part bits that you did enjoy and, and whatnot um, this video is now officially a little bit over an hour um, so I hope you got some value out of this I hope you learned something or if nothing else if you're considering going to a boot camp you're considering going to Flatiron and you're really like serious about doing data science, uh, I hope this gives you an idea of um, what Flatiron really has to offer. Because like I said, it's called a, it falls in the category of coding bootcamp. Um, but you can see most of this module, at least like the last week I've been doing, I've been doing like a little bit of code, but it's been a lot of like mathematics and theory and stuff too. So we're doing a lot more than just coding. Um, we're, we're, we're genuinely like learning data science. Um, so if you're trying to pick a, boot camp to go to and you've you're and you're decided on data science if you're on the fence about software engineering data science i can't really speak uh, to that but if you're decided on data science and you're trying to pick a boot camp uh, i think flat arms a really great one to go to because you're going to learn a lot more than just how to write the code you're going to learn um like deeply what you're writing code about and i think that's incredibly valuable in terms of being uh valuable in the job market all right so um, next module is uh, 
a little bit of calculus and this thing called gradient descent, um, which is going to address some of that big O notation, like computational complexity issues I talked about a second ago. So that'll be really interesting. Again, I'm gonna do another topic review. It's gonna be the same thing. I'm gonna have my one pager and I'm gonna make a Jupyter notebook based off my one pager and we'll do uh, a little video about it or a long video about it, I guess. Um, I did just cram like, you know, 50, 60 hours of coursework into one hour. So I guess that's not too bad, all things considered. Uh, so anyway, like I said before, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, share this with your friends. Um, check out the links in the description below and I'll see you next time.